Praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Could we just give the Lord praise one more time? Amen. He's worthy. Amen. He is worthy. We're so, th we're so thankful that we are able to come into the house of the Lord and, and worship with you and, and praise His name forever because He's the one that deserves the praise and the honor and the glory today. And uh, we, that's the reason we come here today and, and to acknowledge who He is and to get to learn uh, just a little bit more and to fall in love with Him just a little bit deeper this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, we are so thankful, as I said, um, just to be able to, to, to handle the Word of God. You know, uh, I pray that we would never take for granted the fact that we're able to come into a building like this and have the freedom that we do to, to read the Word, to share with others, to, to, to be uh, just a part of the body of Christ. But you know, it doesn't stop here this morning. This is only the beginning. This is where we come. This is where we, we, we get, uh, you know, Energize. The Bible says uh, iron sharpens iron. The, uh, these people that are around you are here to help you, to build you up, to strengthen you. So, so that when you get ready to go out there after you leave this place and all through the week, uh, you have a mission field. You have a job to do. And, and so this morning, you're here to be trained. You're here to be, to be built up, to be strengthened in your faith so that you, can, you and I can go out there and we can do what God has called us to do. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and you would stand for the reading of God's word this morning praise God we've been talking about the beatitudes and what it means to be a part of uh, and, and what it means to have these kind of attitudes and, and, and it's just, just been such an awesome study but Jesus continues his message and we call it the, the sermon on the mount and Jesus just really drives home these Beatitudes and, and the effect that they have. And right here, starting with uh, verse 13, he says, And you are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot, the foot of men. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us this morning. We know that, Father, that, that we have come, Father, here to worship you. But I pray that, God, that you would help us to really think about that, God, and to really be encouraged by your word, to be strengthened, God, and not take for granted the fact that we get to hear, Father, what your spirit is speaking to us this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that that you would minister to, to every heart, to every soul, to every mind, to every person. And Lord, I pray that your word would go forth and that God, that we would look to you at all times and give you the praise that you deserve. Strengthen us this morning. Help us to be the salt of the earth to truly understand what that means. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're talking about the salt of the earth. And, and as I said, we're continuing uh, just with this, this thought in mind, the Sermon on the Mount, because I know the Beatitudes were, were uh, a part of that message that Jesus had preached. And, and the, greatest, the greatest sermon, the greatest uh, message ever preached. Uh, it came from Christ Himself, and it was at this time. And, and, and we just... We're so thankful that we get to study it. We, we get to kind of peel back the layers and, and continue to see what God is doing and, and what God really meant for us to, to really receive. And so we want to we wanna stand upon His Word. We don't want to stand upon the arguments of men. We want to stand upon the Word of God. And so again, He says right here, He says, You are the salt of the earth. He's talking to you and to me today. And he says, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth, thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. A little boy had asked his mother, he said, Mom, would you, uh, would you give me a dollar? I'll be a good boy. 
And she said, why don't you be good for nothing like your father? No, I'm just... <laughs> okay, we broke, the, we broke the ice this morning, all right? <laughs> Now, now I need your attention over here, not on the brisket smell that's out there. <laughs> Praise God. But we think about that, and, and you think about Christians today, and you think about Christianity, to, to Christianity today. And I want you to think about your own salvation and where you stand today. These were the words coming from Jesus himself. And I want you to think seriously upon the th uh, upon the, along these lines. Jesus said, that, that if the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing but to be tossed out, trodden under the foot of men. What kind of a Christian am I? And I, and I? And I believe that this takes personal inventory this morning. That we need to really be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves, what kind of a believer am I today? Do I, am I salty? Is there something that others see in me that they desire or would want? You see, we're thinking about salt. Now, this morning you probably uh, put a little bit of salt on, on your breakfast this morning. I don't know, we is, we, we're, we're down here in the valley, we cook with a lot of salt, huh? You just, you just about can't get enough of it, you just keep throwing it on there. But salt is necessary for life. Salt is necessary for life. I want you to think about this. You know, salt is a compound made of sodium. Which is a metal, which is a metal. Now, now think about this. It, it's about the consistency of hard cheese. In chemistry, you take a little bit of sodium, you drop it in some water, and you get a very explosive gas out of that sodium. And, and that's called hydrogen gas. Now, think about this. Chlorine is the other element. And, and it's a green poisonous gas. And if you walk into a room full of chlorine, you'd be dead in a little while. Now, these are two very dangerous things that if they were ingested by themselves, uh, you and I would die. But yet God in his, and you think about God in his wisdom, he took these in his chemistry, chemistry set, if you will, and he, and he put them together and he made sodium chloride, which we call today table salt. What an amazing God we serve. He takes two things that could be very deadly on their own and he puts them together and that's what we get our, 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 where we get our table salt. Now I want you to think about this today, how God took the elements of your life that were very dangerous, the old man, and he took it to the cross and he put it with the cross and he crucified everything there. And the Bible says that he puts on us and he gives us a new name. Now, you and I are called the salt of the earth. And, and I want you to think along these lines this morning. We are to be salty saints. We are to be salty saints. Now, here's the dynamic of pure salt. And I want you to see this. Why did Jesus use this kind of a metaphor? Why did Jesus use this kind of figure of speech? When he described people, those people that he was speaking to in the Beatitudes, he would, he would call them the salt of the earth. See, you'd have to understand the importance of salt in Jesus' time. You see, salt is something that we may take for granted today because you can go just buy it on a, uh, at, your, at your local corner store and, and pull a little bit off the shelf and use it for your own good. But in Jesus' time, in that society, salt, and we're talking about pure salt, was more valuable than gold. Now, now in our society, gold means a whole lot because, because as we said, salt is so, so common, it's so feasible. You can go and grab it and, and, it doesn't, and, and, and there's no uh, waiting time, if you will. But pure salt was rare in the time of Christ. Pure salt was a medium of exchange. As a matter of fact, we get our English word salary from the word that means salt money. And that's why we understand the saying, if you will, he is worth his salt, or she is worth her salt. Or, on the other hand, 
They're not worth their salt. You see, you think of the importance of salt. It was a source of, of, of money or worth. It was valuable. And why was it valuable? Because of what it did. Why is it valuable today? Because of what it does. So number one, salt seasons this morning. And, 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 and we're talking about being salty saints, okay? So, so I want you to think about this. Salt seasons. Salt causes flavor to come alive. In the book of Job, in Job chapter 6 and verse 6, it says this. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? After all, what do you do when something doesn't taste all that good? Put a little bit more salt on it. Does it have enough? Not enough. Put a little more salt on it. And then he says this. He says, is there any taste in the white of an egg? Now, now, now can an egg be eaten without salt? If you want to. I'd rather not. But see, it was an under, it's an understanding and, and, and gaining a, a greater understanding of, of, of how important salt really is. It, it's what it does. It's, it's seasons. So a, a little boy said, uh, salt is that which tastes bad when you don't have it. Now think of the wisdom behind that. Salt is that which tastes bad when it's, when it's missing. Think about a Christian who has lost their savor. I don't know if you've ran across a couple of those in your lifetime, but they don't taste very good. We're not, and we're not promoting cannibalism this morning, but <laughs> it's a person who's lost their seasoning. It's a person who, who, who no longer has a zest or an excitement for life. See, Christians are to give life. Christians are, are, are to give life to society. They're, they're, they're supposed to add flavor. They're supposed to add zeal. They're supposed to bring a, somewhat of an excitement to life. See, most people in America are simply, they just simply live bland lives. I want you to think about it this morning. When you go to work tomorrow, there's a lot of people, they just live flavorless lives. They'll go to work on a Monday morning, and this is the reason that they're always trying to do something uh, to make life a little bit more excitement. Many people turn to drugs and other things to try to find some kind of a high. They're always looking for, for something to make life a little bit more exciting. See, most people when they go to work tomorrow and, you, and, and as you're there, they're not interested in heaven or hell. The only thing they're interested in is, is getting through tomorrow, making it through Monday. The mundane. They have nothing to look forward to. They have nothing to, 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 to put any hope into. See, they all, all they want to know is, is, is uh, what time is it? Is it almost Friday? Is it almost the weekend? They're always living for something that, that's going to bring them some kind of excitement or thrill. Can I tell you this? This is not, a, this is not an exciting way to live. But yet as believers, what we may not realize is that, that there is something exciting about being a Christian today. We have a hope that when we wake up, we can, we can arise from our bed and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I mean, I, I, I don't know about some people, but, but I will rejoice and be glad in it. These last couple days I've been saying that because that weather has been so good and I've just been thanking God for it. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made and I'll rejoice and be glad in it. Why? I've got something to live for. I live for Christ. See, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 says this. It says, let your speech always be seasoned with salt. Let it be exciting. Let it be flavorful. Let it be something that others can, can, can just kind of, you know, you, you, they're working on something and you're over there talking about Christ and they've got one ear on you and they're trying to focus over here and they're just kind of like, wait, hey, wait, wait a minute. What did you say? Or what, did they, or what did they say about us? Oh, there's nothing to see there. 
You see, there ought to be something about every Christian that's just, just absolutely exciting. There ought to be something that drives you, that woke you up this morning. Last night, I was just like, you know what? I determined in myself last night. I don't know how long this is going to last. But I said, you know what? I'm going to keep waking up at the same time. I'm not even, yeah, sure, my clock may change, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep waking up at the same time. And, and this morning, even if I would have tried, I couldn't have stayed asleep. I just woke up and, and, and I just, just said, you know what? This is, this, I've got something to live for. I looked forward to coming to church today. I looked forward to seeing you this morning. I looked forward to hearing the word of God and what God was going to speak to our hearts. I looked forward to the worship. I looked forward to all of this. Why? Because God has something for us every day of our lives. Let your speech be seasoned with salt Always, there ought to be something exciting about us as Christians. People ought to want to listen into our conversations. You know, the Bible says that the angels listen in on our conversations. They're excited about what we have to say. Mm. Unless we're one of those churches where the angels have moved on and said, there's something more exciting happening at the other church. I hope not. You see, there ought to be something exciting about being a Christian. I believe that that's why a lot of people choose not to be a Christian. Because when we stop, we stop realizing that Christianity is an exciting thing. I can tell you this, when we begin to preach what is, what is true, what is absolute, I can tell you, then, then, then the young people, they, they don't, they're not looking to be entertained. They're looking for a challenge. They're not looking just merely to be entertained. They're looking for a challenge. You say, well, well, is that true, Pastor? Yeah, just look at on YouTube, all the challenges. Many of them put their lives on the line just to be challenged. See, Christianity is a challenge. Christianity, to live a life that is, that is full, a life that has so much that is abundant and overflowing, it's, it's so awesome. And that's what Christianity was supposed to be. You know, when Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, I can tell you this, this was a challenge to the people of his time. They were excited to, to hear what he had to say. Because the Bible says he didn't speak as those, as everyone else spoken, had spoken. He spoke as one that actually had authority, that knew what he was talking about. You are the salt of the earth. See, there ought to be a zest, a zeal about us. A flavor about the children of God because salt seasons. Another thing that salt does is salt also preserves. Jesus was telling us, you and I, that we're the salt of the earth. Now what you have to understand is Jesus is sitting here preaching the Sermon on the Mount by the Sea of Galilee. There were fishermen in that crowd. See, Jesus knew who he was preaching to. He knew the audience that was there. And he says in, in verse 13 again, he says, you are the salt of the earth. See, obviously he was talking about a preserving power that salt has. Sure, salt seasons. But salt also preserves. See, in that day, salt prevented decay from the, from the food or the rations that they had. And, and, and every fisherman would have known what Jesus was talking about. It, it prevented decay. It also restrained corrupt, uh, corruption from coming in. And it was necessary for the fishermen of that day to take and, and, and sprinkle salt over their catch so that it would, it would be preserved. You see, we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't understand what that means. They didn't know how long they were going to be out there. They many times went out there fishing for days. And they couldn't risk their, their spoil or their fish uh, to, go, to get spoiled. And so it was a preserving agent. Can I tell you this? The gospel still has the power to preserve. The gospel still has the power to save life. If, if in any day the preaching of the gospel is needed, it's in this day... When we are looking around our world, and I don't know about you, but there is a moral decay that has set in society. A moral decay. 
And, and not, in, not just in society, but see, here's the problem, is when the salt begins to lose its flavor, it's because society is imposing upon Christianity, and Christians are being influenced rather than being the influence. And when we begin to bend, when we begin to bow, when we begin to give in to the pressures of society, we begin to lose our savor. And at that moment, we begin to decay just like the rest of them. And then we begin to compromise and everything else begins to come in. And then we say, well, this isn't so bad. And that's not that bad. And, and oh, you know what? They're really not that bad. They're not, I, I, I mean, I know that they're that, that they may do this or that. And, and the problem is, is because too many Christians have started taking part in the things that the world would impose upon them. But salt preserves. It preserves the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Salt also heals. Not only does it flavor, not only does it preserve but it also heals. Now I want you to turn with me in 2 Kings chapter 2. And I want you to see, and, and let me set this up just a little bit. This is, this is the time when Elisha was there and, and the land was barren, if you remember. The land was barren, um, wasn't producing any fruit, crops weren't growing, livestock were, were miscarriaging, uh, women were miscarriaging, something was wrong. In their, in their society, if you will, in their land. Something was missing. And so, I, I, I love the fact that they didn't go to the politician. I love the fact that they didn't, they didn't go to the farmer. I want you to think about this. And, and, and I want you to think, I, I, I really want you to think about this. They didn't go to the scientist they didn't go to the chemist. They didn't go to, to somebody else. They went to the man of God. Man of God. Our women are, are miscarriaging. Our livestock is miscarriaging. Our land isn't producing fruit. I, I, I don't know if you... I, I think it was uh, Wednesday when I was talking about if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Not the world, but Jesus, God is saying, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray. Can I tell you, that this, it's the same thing happening in our society today. And we would say, well, what we need to do, we just need a revival. We need, we need multitudes to come out of the world and come. No, we just need the church to be the church. We need the salt to be salt again. The salt has lost its savor. It's lost its preserving power. It's lost its power to, to, to heal today. And so here's what he says. Starting with verse 19. He says, And the many men of the city said unto Elijah, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. Now I want you to think about what he's saying. He says, Everything on the outside looks good. This city looks good on the outside. I, I, I mean, I mean, what do they say? Rotten to the core. Because it might look good on the outside. I mean, I mean, we've got buildings, we've got everything going on. Society looks good. People have money. Everything looks good on the outside. And you know, that's the way a lot of Christians are. They look good on the outside. Bible says that they're dead men's bones. Whitewashed tombs. And you see, this is what happened in this city. America may look good on the outside. But you know the core of this, of America? You know the heart of America? It's not in Washington. It's the church. If my people who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, turn from their evil ways, their wicked ways, then would I hear from heaven and heal their land. 
And this is, this is exactly what is happening here. Listen what he says again. He says, The men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant my Lord, as my Lord sees, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. And he said, Bring me a new cruise and put salt therein, and they brought it to him. You see, he needed a new cruise. You are not something that is refurbished or fixed up. The Bible says you are a new creation. All things have passed away. All things are made new. You are not something that God just, just refurbished. No, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. God isn't looking for something that is merely broken down. He's looking for you to accept Him full on and say, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to Christ. The old man is dead. The new man is here. You say, well, why couldn't he just take some any old, old, any old vessel? Why couldn't he just take any old vessel? Any old vessel would do. Any old sinner would do. No, he chooses a new cruise. He chooses to make you and I new. And listen, look what it says. He says, put some salt in it. He says, verse 21, And when he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Let the salt be the salt again. Let the Christians be salty again. Let them come to that place where Christ is our life. I no longer live, but it's Christ that lives in me. See, salt heals. And therefore, you and I have been brought here, put here, so that we can bring healing to a nation that is dying. But if the salt loses its savor, can I ask you this? If the church loses its ability to bring life, to bring healing, then what hope is there for this nation? If we as Christians say, hey, you know what? In order to win them, we have to become like them. Then we've lost our savor. And there's no hope for this nation. Can I tell you this? But as long as we are separated unto God, for the glory of His name. Who cares what anybody thinks about us? Who cares what they say about us? We are the salt of the earth and we are here to preserve this nation. We are here and the only reason... Now, I, now I, wanna, I want you to see this because the only reason that your neighborhood is safe is because you live there. And I said this on Wednesday. The only reason that your neighborhood is safe is because you live there. You're the one preserving it. The only reason that disease hasn't broke out in your home is because you're there and you're a believer. You're the salt of the earth. The only reason that your husband or your wife, if they're not a believer today, the only reason that they're doing well and that they are blessed is because you're there. The only reason that your job and where you, where you work is even alive and even doing well is because you work there. Now that isn't to be taken in some arrogant way so you can walk in there and say, oh, it's because of me. No, it's to understand that you are the salt of the earth and God has put you there for a purpose. That is to preserve it, to bring healing to it. In the Bible times, when a baby was born, they would actually give that baby a saline bath. To heal it and stop any kind of infection from moving into that child. Maybe, maybe, we don't, maybe we don't realize what God is trying to say to us today. That the reason that we're here is because there's an infection that's wanting to move into our society and into our world. And we can see it all around. But God will not let it move in because we're here. That's what he told Abraham when he wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, if, if you can find 50, then he come back with 45 and finally got down. If he says, if you find 10 righteous men, will you spare the city? He says to Abraham, if you can find me 10 people who love me, who are called by my name, who have humbled themselves, who have prayed, 
who have repented of their sins and turned from their wicked way, he says, I'll save Sodom and Gomorrah. Sad thing is that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because he couldn't find ten righteous men. If God was to come and give that ultimatum to the city of Edinburgh today, would he find the righteous men needed, the righteous women needed? Think about it. Salt also burns. Salt's an irritant. Not only does it heal, but it's also an irritant. Have you ever gotten a cut or, or a wound and somebody put a little bit of salt in it or you, it burns, it stings? You see, Mark chapter 9 and verse 49 says, For everyone shall be salted with fire. What's he saying? He's saying fire and salt have something in common. Fire and salt have something in common. Salt burns. It's an irritant. So I, wanna, I, I, I want you to understand something. When you and I begin to speak the truth, the Word of God, it's going to make some people uneasy. It's going to, but why? Because why is it making people, why would it make somebody uneasy? Jesus says that I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Why should that make anybody uneasy? I can tell you why. Because that truth has been poured into a wound. That truth has been poured in to a wound, a putrid wound of this world that they don't know what life even means. They don't know what it is to live life, much less to have an abundant life. What do you mean? Misery, decay, everything around them. Depression and all the other come into the church. Let me ask you. Let me, let me, let me put this across your, 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 your mind if I can. Imagine if all Christians were just, were just depressed all the time. See, why is it Satan wants you to be depressed? Why is it Satan is attacking your mind? Why is it Satan is bringing all of these things against you? Because he doesn't want you to be the, the salt of the earth. Because he doesn't want you to be a preserving agent. Because he doesn't want you to have life and share that life with somebody else. But once you understand that you are the salt of the earth, that that, that sickness cannot live in that same place. That that salt right now is, is an irritant to the world. He hates it when Christians are the salt of the earth. He hates it when Christians have joy. He hates it because it begins to irritate everything else around them. There are a lot of people, amen. There are a lot of people who want a non-irritant, if you will, brand of a gospel. That means that it has no effect upon their lives. It doesn't affect them in a negative way. It doesn't affect them because, because you know, as long as the church, I, I'll go to church as long as it doesn't, doesn't bother me. As long as it doesn't, doesn't get to the heart of the issue. As long as it doesn't make me feel bad. As long as it doesn't bring conviction upon me. But you preach the Word of God and you're going to be an irritant to the world. You're not going to be the friend because salt burns and salt also penetrates. You see, real salt penetrates. You can take just a pinch of salt and put it into a gallon of water and it'll permeate that entire gallon of water. You know that as a fact, salt is, is one of the few major uh, compounds that dissolves equally well in cold and hot water. It doesn't need to be hot water. But it dissolves equally well. You see, what we need to do is, is we need to get the salt to the source. And that's what the Word of God, doesn't God tell us this? That the Word of God is quick, it is sharp, it is sharper than any double-edged sword, that it pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit, bone, marrow, thought, intent. See, that's the salt Salt penetrates and permeates everything in, in life. The, the church ought to permeate every, every society in life, every part of life. 
The church ought to be in every place, every business, everywhere. It ought, to, it ought to permeate all of society. You know what happens to many churches? All we become is, is giant warehouses of salt. Salt doesn't salt salt. Salt doesn't need salt. What we have to do is become salt shakers. We, we come into the house of God. We're filled to overflowing. And then when we leave this place, we go out and we begin to share and, and sprinkle that salt everywhere. And let salt permeate our society. See, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, you and I would become so infectious. We'd become a virus to society. That people would see our lives and they would want to know what it is that is different about us. If we had actually lived the life that Christ has called us to live. He says, you are the salt of the earth. You are, he didn't say you're the salt of the church. He said, you're the salt of the earth. You see, it's good to come to church and it's necessary to come to church. It's needful to come to church. And, and Jesus, the Bible tells us that even more so as we see that day approaching. But the reason it's needful to come to church is so that we can leave this place and really begin to penetrate society and make a difference in our world. And we strengthen one another when we come in. We've heard a lot about separation of church and state. See, anytime a preacher stands up and he begins to preach the Word of God and stands on any real issue, you talk about abortion, you talk about all of the things that Christians are supposed to stand for, all of a sudden everybody's screaming, separation of church and state, they don't even understand what it really means. It was, that the, it was that the government wasn't supposed to come in and try to impose itself in the church, not the other way around. But they've tried to make it seem the other way around. But I can tell you this, when all of a sudden the church and, and, and people start saying, hey, we don't want to hear that kind of a thing. What most Christians do is they, they, they just go silent. They go dark. And then they go under and they, they, they don't even talk about Christ anymore. Well, I tried and it didn't work, so I just figure I'll just keep to myself. Well, you've lost your savor. That's what you've done. No, stand upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ, and speak to a world the things that Christ has declared to you. He said, the things that you have heard in secret, go to the rooftops and tell it and scream it, and let the people know what God has done. We need to stand for what we believe. We are the salt of the earth. See, God's people, if we don't speak out, hell will begin to move in. When we look at the world and how, how Satan is trying to come into every part of society, you see, think about how that infection begins to move in. And yet, as the salt of the earth, when we're there, Satan doesn't get to move in. Separation from sin, yes. But isolation from sinners, no. We are to be out there in society, the salt of the earth, preserving. As I said, the very reason that, you're, that those people that you work with, that things haven't taken place in their life is because you're part of their life. You are the salt in, in their life. And I pray that your salt would begin to, to take effect and, and begin to change their life. You want to come, Julio? The problem with us as believers is we sit in auditoriums all over the world. And all we do is we just become a, a glorified salt shaker. You see, what happens in a lot of Christian circles, and this is why, this is why as believers, we're not, we're not to be judgmental in the sense of being judgmental. We're to speak truth. We're to speak truth. But to be judgmental is, is to talk about somebody without really ever wanting to do something about it. Christians use this little thing called, and it's an excuse called prayer sometimes. Well, let me, let me tell you about so-and-so just because so we can pray about it.
If you're going to say something, you better take it to the Lord in prayer. Instead of sharing the salt of the earth and, 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 and being the salt of the earth and preserving and bringing flavor and healing and all of these things, for the most part, the church has been the opposite. And I'm not talking about ours individually. I'm talking about it as a whole. I'd like to think that it's, that it's not so here. I would like to think that, that we are believers and that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we, we take seriously the Word of God and we're, we're not just hearers, but we're actually doers of the Word of God. In 1985 in New Orleans, Louisiana, there was a celebration. They were celebrating the, the park uh, commission was celebrating that they had gone through an entire summer without one drowning in the city pools. They were so excited about that that there were 200 people there as they were having their celebration with those 200 people. There were 100 lifeguards and they were celebrating. And at the end of the celebration, four lifeguards that were there that night looked into the bottom of the pool and there was a fully dressed man drowned in the midst of a hundred lifeguards. Jerome Moody, age 31, drowned, surrounded by a hundred lifeguards. Wonder how many people are going to hell while Christians stand by watching because they've lost their savor and they're no longer the salt of the earth. How many people are going to go to hell all around us what about our neighbors? What about the person living in the home next to you, in front of you, behind you? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to come to church. You know, and, and, and I've found it even that it's easy sometimes even, even to speak to people out on the street. But your neighbor... Oh, why? Because they see you every day. They see the way you live. They see if you truly are the salt of the earth. They see. What about your own home? Bring it even closer. We're trying to win that loved one that's lost, that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And they're watching our life. It's not to mean that you're not going to make a mistake, but when you do, it's, it's to humble ourselves and to say, you know what, I made a mistake. Would you pray for me? See, we're the salt of the earth. We're the hope of the world. Of course, we know that that's Jesus, but Jesus labeled you and I the salt of the earth, that, that without us, where's the rest of the world? And if we lose our saltiness, then, then what happens next? I, I hope that you think about this. Next week, we're going to get into just some of the effects that have taken place over the world and just, just delve in just a little bit deeper. But with this thought in mind, that we are the salt of the earth. And depending on your saltiness, people will either come or, or reject the gospel altogether. Let me ask you, and, the, and, and, and I guess the, the only way that I know how. Will you please reevaluate where you stand and allow Christ to change you and me so that we truly are the salt of the earth? Would you stand this morning? I know we could come into church and see, and this is, this is another reason. This is a this is a salty message. To some, it may taste good. To others, it just makes us real uncomfortable. Because it's the truth. But I can tell you this, I'd rather have the truth. And I'd rather hear the truth. And I'd rather know the truth. Than to continue in a lie. And I pray that today that you would hear 
what God is speaking to your heart individually because I believe that He speaks to us as individuals. I'm not here to point the finger, but I can tell you this, the Spirit of God knows right where you're at. And He's, and he's dealing with you one way or another. And I pray that we can, we can truly be the salt of the earth as we continue this morning and as we leave this place. And, and not just in here, but when we walk out these doors, others would know that there is something different about us. Not just because of what we say, but because of who we are today. I and mean, if, you're, if you're in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to I pray with you first of all this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed. See, the Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ died and that the Father rose, it raised Him from the dead, if we believe that in our heart and we confess that with our mouth, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. And at that moment, when we, when we make that confession and we make Him Lord of our lives, then at that moment, the Spirit of God moves in. Our sins are wiped away. The Spirit of God moves in and He helps us to begin to live a life that is honoring and pleasing to God. You're never alone from that moment on because Jesus said, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. But I'll go with you to the ends of the world. And so I want to pray with you today. And if you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then I want to pray with you. And we're all going to pray in just a minute. But this is a very, <clears throat> this is a very important decision today. And I haven't done this in a while, but I'm going to do it this morning. If you're here in this place with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, I want to ask you if that's you today and you'd say, you know what, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life, save Lord and Savior of my life. I want you just to raise your hand right there. You can put it right back down. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? I don't want to leave you out. And I want to pray with you. Amen. And I want to pray with you. And as we pray out, everyone's going to pray this prayer. As we said, believe in our heart. We confess with our mouth. He's faithful and just. Would you pray with me? Father, forgive me because I am a sinner. But today, I know what you did on the cross for me. Your body was broken open. Your blood poured out for my sin. Today, I'm asking that you would be my Savior, my Lord, and my God, in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would be my guide, that you would lead me into all truth, that I may be the salt of the earth, in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, today we just pray, Father, for each and every person that's in this place. God, you know where we are, Father, in our walk with you, God. And, and Father, today we, we are not here to try to disguise ourselves. But God, we're here really to be real with ourselves, God, and to, to really take inventory. That God, if there's, for whatever reason, if there's, if I've lost my Savior, Lord, I pray that, God, that you would, you would help me, that your life would pour into me, that your word would come alive in me, that, God, that I would truly be the salt of the earth, God, that you would help me, Father, that you would help me to see, Father, and just be honest with, with myself and, and who I am, God, in you, Christ. And, and I pray that, God, that your life would come into each and every one, Father, that, God, that we would, we would once again, Father, live to glorify you, that God, that you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation that others may see, Father, and rejoice, O oh God. I pray that God, that we would be effective in the kingdom, God. That Father, that once again, we would be that preserving agent, Father. That we would be that healing agent, God. That Father, that you, Father, would, would help us, God, to, to just, God, stir things up, Father. That you, Father, would be glorified in us and through us, O oh God. 
God, for the glory and the honor of your name. That God, that we would stand boldly for who you are. And that Lord, that we would be the believers that you called us to be. God, we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. To you be the glory, the honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God.